Hey, it's Ryan from Oscar Logo Studios. Uh, I've been working on a new track with the Mate, and I uh, thought I'd show you a little bit more detail uh, on the sample instrument, uh, specifically the process I was using um, in the last video to sample my pocket operator and then slice it up and mangle the audio in weird and interesting ways. Uh, and so here's the track I've been working on. The percussion you're hearing is the PO12, uh, but obviously it's been downsampled quite a bit. And um, to do that, I wanted to capture a clean sample and uh, and store that on the mate tracker. That way I had the clean archive for um, where I wanted more of the original sound, PO12 sound and then a lo-fi version of that instrument for use in stuff like this. So uh, let's jump in and take a look at the sampler. I'm gonna go into edit and uh, let's talk a little bit about the features here. So uh, across the top, uh, you've got the start command. Hitting edit will uh, start the recording or arm the recording depending on what you get centered on the arm value. Uh, for source, we've got a couple of options here. I can choose the left of the stereo 3.5 millimeter input, the right side of the 3.5 millimeter stereo input, input, the USB audio input, uh, or all. So there's no separate stereo, just the inline uh, audio option. It's all or left or right mono. Um, all input is recorded at 16-bit, although you can load 32-bit samples if you've put them directly onto the S micro SD card. Um, volume is a gain control for the incoming audio. And so if I play my PO12 here, uh, it looks like nothing is peaking. We're actually in pretty good shape. Um, but if it was, you know, obviously the goal is highest possible signal to noise, signal to noise ratio, so maximizing the gain, uh, maintaining a low noise floor. Um, the cool thing is there's a normalization process you can implement at either the entire wave level or uh, at the individual slice level, and I'll talk through that later. Arm is the recording arm threshold, and so when I start the recording, uh, you can see the little double white line there. Anything above that audio level will trigger the recording to start. And then play uh, allows you to play uh, along starting from a particular row uh, while you're recording. So if you wanted to record a live performance um, along with your current arrangement in the mate, I'm not gonna use that feature right now. Uh, instead, I'm just gonna go ahead and record a new sample over the one I've got here. So hitting edit, arms the recording, nothing's happening right now. I'm gonna make sure I've got uh, both my patterns here selected and ready to play in series. I'm gonna hit play, I'm gonna kinda of count in my head and once I've gotten all 16 samples, I'll hit edit to stop the recording. Excellent. Looks like I did a pretty good job stopping that. There's nothing on the back end that I need to trim off. If I had to, I would come to the selection here, uh, use edit to trim off uh, you know, the dead space at the end, and then run the crop command to truncate the actual wave. Uh, so the next thing I wanna do is chop up the samples here. Obviously there are 16. I could go through individually with each slice, setting the start and end points based on where I think the audio should start or end. I can use the zoom to get a pretty close approximation, but uh, even for 16, that's tedious. Uh, fortunately, if you hold down, option and then cycle through the processes. There are some preset slicing algorithms. Auto is gonna use transient detection. That's pretty close, but I found for something like this where you've got clear delineation between your peaks, running the silent command, which looks for silence between each of those transients, works exceptionally well. So I'm gonna go ahead and run slice silent. It's gonna execute, tells me slicing is completed. And now I've got 16 very clean slices directly from my pocket operator. Now, some of these are a little bit quiet. Obviously, when you're laying them out on the grid, you can increase the, um, the volume of that particular note. Uh, another thing you can do is run the normalize process. And so if I come up here and let's say select the track as a whole or select any individual uh, uh, slice, this snare, for example, I can run normalize. 
now you see I've got a large big snare transient um, alternatively as I mentioned if I come if I select this file as a whole and then run normalize it runs it on the entire thing since I've already normalized that single snare transient it's not going to do much because running it on the whole file is going to look for the largest peak set that to 0 dB so once you normalize one you kind of have to do them all independently but it's as easy as select your slice normalize so I'm not going to go through all those. The other things I want to show, um, I'm going to jump back and normalize the kick because I'm going to use the kick and the snare to demo this next part. Uh, we've got some pretty neat downsample algorithms. 8-bit uh, is kind of a preset cut in half. It'll be 8 or 16 depending on the current sample rate of the uh, source wave file. And so since this was recorded directly on the M8, it's 16-bit, I can downsample to 8. If I had loaded a 32-bit file, I'd be given a 16-bit downsample option. And then from there, I could downsample again. Or you've got kind of the limitless downsample command, which will cut whatever the sample rate is in half. And so if I play again, my kick and my snare, and I'm just going to select uh, both of these so you can hear what they both sound like. That's the original input, exactly how it sounds, although louder now because I've normalized it from the original PL12. If I run down sample, we've gone now from 16 to uh, 8 bit. Not much of a difference. If I down sample once more, we've now gone from 8 to 4. Definitely hearing a little bit of a difference. Let's do it one more time. 4 to 2. Do it again, just for good measure. Two to one. It's getting ugly. Let's do it once more. Oop. Dance sample. Pretty gross. So I'm going to get out of this. Uh, the other thing I was going to show is chance command. So because your boy's an idiot, it took me a minute to understand what this means. Chance to left and right. The way the chance command works is, uh, depending on where you put it in the effects chain, It'll affect everything to the left of it and everything to the right of it independently. And so the two uh, alphanumeric character value that you have to the chance command, in this case, uh, what looks like 8A, um, is controlling independently the chance of the things occurring on the left and the chance of the things occurring on the right. And this little helpful hint at the bottom tells you what they are. So you use the up down arrows to control the left value and you can see my chance to left is changing. The chance to right is not because I'm not editing that second digit, what would traditionally be in the uh, ones place if you remember your grade school math. And so I had this at 53% chance of occurrence. I have nothing to the right of my chance command, so it doesn't really matter what that value is. Um, but if I had like, let's say a, a heavy reverb send or, or delay send that I wanted to occur half the time on this note, um, I would put that effect here and then I would care what that one's place or the right digit is. And so you can hear if I play this, approximately 53% of the time that G sharp which is some kind of a percussive hit, is playing, and the other 47% of the time, it's not. That's it. All I wanted to share. Uh, I'll play this out and uh, be sharing more tips and tricks as I come across them. Thanks again for watching. Ryan Beard from Monster Logo Studios. Talk to you soon.